Okay. Hello class, we are going to repeat after me. Okay, so bienvenue. Bienvenue. Dans une. Dans une. Une. Nouvelle episode. Nouvelle episode. For the love of sport. For the love of sport. It's a great day today, Marie. And I think you know why. I know you know why. Because I know why. Because it is February 7th, which is National Girls and Women in Sports Day. Amazing. Oh. Amazing. Yes, it is. And what an exciting day. And this episode is in partnership with our friends over at the Women's Sports Foundation who mm-hmm. do just so much work to bring, you know, light and bring women and girls in sports forward. And we want to celebrate them today, all the days actually, but today in particular. Because we got this silly little podcast where we can do that. So, yeah, today we're going to be chatting about, well, I don't want to spoil it too much, but we're going to be diving into a prime woman in sports. And that's just going to be a little cliffhanger if you didn't, you know, read the show notes or the title or you're... Not well, you're just curious about that. who is, who our wonderful guest is. Well, really, they are the is, yeah. woman that brings the Olympics to your television for the last yes. 20 years. No big deal. Just kind of casual. It's but, incredibly casual. Yeah. 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 But we're very excited. And then, I mean, it's it, I'm very excited because it's the marriage of a lot of things. It is the this little tiny thing, this competition that we like to call, you know, the Olympics to, that's happening here coming up this summer. And one of the best countries. And my second language of choice, which is France and French. Wait, you speak I'm French? Oui. You speak French? Oui, bien sûr, mon ami. Je parle okay. beaucoup de français. Before we let Simon get too off the rails, we do yeah. have our wonderful producer, Joe, back on the back game with us. Game Master Joe. Back to He's bring back. the yeah, games. So we're going we're gonna to toss it over him to embarrass us before we get to the guest. So Joe, with that, take her away. Awesome. Well, I'm thrilled to be back. I am surprised I was invited back, but <laughs> I decided that I needed to make it tougher because uh, what you guys did so well last week. You, you, guys, you guys both got one point. Okay. And you were very close to getting that second point. So I decided, I decided that we're going to, we're going to make it a little bit more difficult. So okay. just a reminder, your categories for this wheel spin are yeah. cinematic scoreboard, field of dreams, mascot mayhem, Name that sport, hmm. Olympic oddities, team time travel, and youth sports stars. Okay. Simon, you kicked us off last time, so we're going to go sure. reverse order. Marie. All right. Spin that wheel, Joe. Let's go. Spin, Spin that wheel. I'm feeling good. Youth sports stars. You got Amazing. this one last time. Amazing. Amazing. But if it's harder, I'm nervous. This teenage golf sensation whose first name is Eldrick, but goes by a different name, became the youngest winner of the Masters in 1997. Who is this accomplished golfer? Mm. You got this, Marie. You got it. It's got to be Tiger, right? You're correct. Let's go. All right, you got a point. Eldrick, my guy Eldrick, if you're hearing this. (laughs) My guy. You got a great youth sports story, (laughs) so come on. This is the podcast for you. I mean, not just him, but Charlie too. Like he's got a he's got an amazing new sports story with maybe our uh, Father's Day episode this year. Oh, oh, last year. Tiger and Charlie. I mean, that's <laughs> all right, Simon. Yeah. You are up. Ready to spin that wheel? Spin that wheel. Yeah. Your category <laughs> is oh, for the first time yet, a cinematic scoreboard. Okay. Ooh, I've been looking forward to this one. This one's okay. fun. Presented by our friends at Fandango. Newly, yeah. I just coined it. Nice. Thanks, Fandango. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I'm going to be shocked if you don't know this. In the baseball movie, A League of Their Own, a memorable line is delivered by Tom Hanks, who portrays the team manager. What is this famous line? Yeah, I believe it is. There's no crying in baseball. You are correct. All right. You guys both have two points. Okay. <sighs> even All right. Or next time. Yeah. Uh, Marie. Yeah. Are you ready for question number two? I am. Send it. Awesome. Marie, your category is Field of Dreams. 
Okay. Uh, as a recap, okay. last week we had, or on our last episode, we had the yeah. KFC Yum Center. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, right. On a different route. Okay. This iconic stadium known as the Big House is the largest stadium in the United States and is home to a storied college football program. What is the name of this university? The University of Michigan. That's right. Nice ding, one. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah. While it is the largest in the nation. That is kind of crazy. We have actually. some absolutely bonkers stadiums here in the United States, yet Michigan holds the crown still. Like that's, that's a crazy. college stadium. Yeah. yeah. Nonetheless, like, yeah. Not professional. No. College. They don't call it the big house for nothing. And packed week after Every week. Yeah. yeah. Just amazing. Congrats to Michigan fans on their yeah. national title. Simon, are you ready for your next question? I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm ready. Another new category. Boy. We have Mascot mm. Mayhem. If this is what I think it is, I'm, I am, I am pumped. Your question. Albert and Alberta are the mascots for which NCAA Division I school? Boy. Okay, so... I thought we were going. Okay, I thought. Okay, the yeah. toughest question so far of the day. This is it's the mascot's name. It's not. It's like the actual like mascot mascot's name, not the. Okay, that's their that's their name. I'm oh, man. pretty sure, pretty sure we are talking about the big elephants for the University of Alabama. No. <laughs> wait, man. Wait. <laughs> Florida Gators. I have no idea. It is the Florida Gators. All right. How did you I won't just get a point? I don't get a point. I don't get a point. I will, I will own that because I right. said Alabama. Everybody first. else heard that. No point. Okay. We but could I'll, easily just Marie. edit this and it would. I know, but that wouldn't be Looking honest, good. Marie. Yeah, that's I'm, true. I know. And I. All about Your job. Is I'm winning, so I don't know why I'm making a stink about yeah, anything. Yeah, stink and remember, there's a big mystery prize at the end of the season. Oh, yeah, that's right. There is a mystery prize. <laughs> Better luck next year. Kicking myself. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you, Joe. For coming on, thanks Make for having us me. Think back. a little bit. We will uh, consider having you back one more time, or three, yes. four, <laughs> maybe ten. We'll see. The rest of the season, yeah, we'll have you back. <laughs> <on for sure. laughs> All right. With that being said, I think it's time we take it back over to our uh, Olympic in Paris theme. Simon, yeah. you want to get our listener back in the mood because we have the wonderful, amazing yeah. Molly Solomon who. Mm-hmm runs the production for all of the Olympics that NBC does, as well as the golf channel, which sounds like, you know, and also the golf channel and also the golf channel, also the prime place where people go and watch golf. But today we're going to be focusing more on the Olympics part of that with the Olympics coming up in Paris, super exciting, but you know, obviously you know, we get to talk to her about all that sort of stuff that she does in her day job. But at the end of the day, she also raises and has raised triplets. Yeah. And helped them get through youth sports and went along that journey. Yeah. And that is crazy and impressive. And we get to talk all about that with her as well. So with that, want to bring her on? Absolutely. Oh, we, we, if you will. Oh, we, we, yeah. All right, everybody, buckle up. We have with us today Molly Solomon. She is the executive producer and president of NBC Olympics Production and executive producer at the Golf Channel. Now, if you've watched golf or the Olympics... Or, you know, just, you know, sports in general over the last 30 years, odds are high that you've come across her work. Molly's been a critical player in bringing us some of the most unforgettable moments in sports television history. Starting as a researcher for NBC's Olympics coverage, she climbed all the way up to become the first ever female executive producer for a national sports network. Under Molly's leadership, NBC Sports has brought innovation and creativity to sports broadcasting. Today, we look forward to talking with her about her own experience as a mother to triplets. And yes, you heard that right, triplets. We will learn about their youth sport experiences from her perspective, her own love of sport, uh, the role that parents play in youth sport activities, and many, many, many other questions we have outlined here today because we are so excited that she's here. But first, let's just start with welcoming her on. Molly Solomon, welcome to the For the Love of Sport podcast. This is the coolest thing. I never get to talk about my kids and sports and the confluence of Olympics. So you guys are like combining all the things I love. So I'm honored and humbled to be invited in. Thank you. Of course. Absolutely. Of course. It's we're we are also equally as honored and humbled and it's a good thing the camera is not very high def, otherwise you'd see nothing but goosebumps. Like literally just nothing but goosebumps. <laughs> it's wild to think, you know, how much 
how much of a, a hand you've had and in part shaped my own sports viewing experience, let alone everybody else's. And I'm curious, I think an obvious way to start out here, Marie, of all the ways we can start out here, let's just hit on the number one question. Molly, can you tell us about your own youth sports experience? Sure. I'm an army brat, as they say. Actually, both my parents were in the military and I was lucky enough to travel around the world. So I grew up in Germany and Italy. And part of being, I think, an army brat is sports is so much a part of what you do. Like I first thing I remember is my dad going out for runs at 6 a.m. every morning. So that kind of, I think, permeated our family. I have two brothers and sisters and my youth sports experience was about running a thousand miles a year. So starting when I was eight years old. Like for some reason, I just wanted to do it. And I actually kept a running diary, you guys, that I still have. My brother's actually writing a book about running right now in our family. Wow. And I handed it over to him, but it was so cool to go through. And my first sports memory is I we lived at West Point. My father was a professor at West Point and I would run to Trophy Point and back. And I remember he would drive by in his, get this green Corvette Ooh. around the corner, <laughs> wave. Wow. <laughs> and that was my memory memory of going running and seeing my dad. And, you know, we did things like we ran Volks marches together when we lived in Germany and Italy, which are really oh road goodness. races for families. And uh, so that really, that running was everything for me. And my dad actually pimped me out. He would take me in high school and junior high, and we'd look through the Washington Post and see what races had the best gifts for age group winners. And that's where we would go. <laughs> so we tried to win Washington Capitals hockey tickets, back then washing bullets NBA tickets so my whole childhood is about running races and oh, wow. I loved it wow that's actually so smart to pick base I feel like I so I dabbled a little bit in running mostly because my brother <laughs> was a runner so he did track and cross country so I was like eh, I could do it running certainly not something you just are like eh, I could do it it's yeah. certainly hard, harder than that but yeah I don't think I've ever thought of it that way of like there are some pretty fun like things for winners or like prizes out there that you could you could get some serious uh, swag or experiences <laughs> through running. So I'm, I'm going to write that one down for sure. <laughs> That's really amazing here and unique too from the people we've had on the podcast as well. And we've talked about the importance of uh, trying a bunch of different sports or being part of a bunch of different sports when they were kids. But running certainly is something that is foundational in a lot of you know things. I'm curious if that is if you encourage that for your own kids when they were when they were growing up to go out for runs did you join them I tried and there wasn't any interest. And that's one of the no. lessons of parenting, right? <laughs> Is that mm. you try. And I thought for sure this gene of running was going to be handed down because my brother and I loved it so very much. And now nobody bit. <laughs> they ran a couple of 5Ks, but like, you know, the turkey trot at Thanksgiving, yeah. that sort of family ritual. <laughs> we have not, we never did it. We ended up going no. out for hikes and things like that. So no, it was not handed down from one generation to another. So I feel like it's one of my failures as a mother yeah. I wasn't able to like create these rituals you need these rituals we don't have that ritual we eat a lot on Thanksgiving well, I think that's what hey. first of all that's what you're supposed to do for. on Thanksgiving that's like <laughs> that's Thanksgiving you just described we're the together. entire we're, holiday it's all that matters we're together and we're watching football you want to know what my family mm -hmm. does together we watch yes. football love mm. that that's Absolutely. a good one do you guys have wait hold on so I imagine that you are fans of a Florida team now, you know, it's super interesting because my family, my side of the family are three generation Washington now Commanders fans. Sure. And so, okay. I mean, I remember going to preseason games, you know, there, sports was a part of everything that we did in my family. And my kids grew up in Connecticut the first eight years of their life. And Connecticut kind of, you're between New England and New York. And so you choose at a very early age, are you going to be a Patriots fan, which was mm. really easy during that time, yeah. or a Giants Jets fan. And so my kids, two of my three became New England fans. And sure. we moved to Florida in when they were eight years old. And I don't know, college football is everything here in Florida where my family lives, but the NFL is not. It's just yeah. not. Yeah. So I got one New England fan, one fantasy fan, and one 49ers fan. And that's because she loved everything about what Colin Kaepernick stood sure. for. Yeah. And a lot of our friends are from the San Francisco area. So she's had, she's having a good run right now. My son is yeah. finally <laughs> learning after all those rings that there's a cycle. Like you don't always stay yes. on top. Yeah. We're, well, I'm from Wisconsin and I'm not a Packer fan, but I... <laughs> 
am getting so much joy from Packer fans now understanding that it's not always rainbows and butterflies. You don't always get up Hall of Fame quarterback. Like, welcome to what it's like to be a regular football fan. And it's so exactly. pleasing to me. It's so it's pleasing. Been, been wonderful to see on my own perspective as a Vikings fan and watching many friends who are Packer fans like see that realization like oh, it's not always this easy mm -hmm. but also college football is just I mean if I can speak candidly about just the different sports we all enjoy college football is like our Saturday tradition it's bacon it's eggs mm -hmm. and it's college game day on every single every single time all time all day I wanted to ask you you know you have this whole history in sport and you said sports was such a large thing for your family growing up too and imagine that sort of shaped of where you wanted to go you know, in your own career. I'm curious of like, you know, lessons learned when, you know, through running or through kind of growing up, having sport, being a part of it, lessons learned throughout the way that sort of helped in establishing your career and kind of moving to where you've gotten now. I think running really taught me, it's a lot like golf and we'll get into golf later, but running taught me that you don't always win. Like I was the kind yeah. of athlete that I overtrained during the summer. So I peaked the first meet of cross country season <laughs> in ninth grade and I would win the first four weeks of the season and then everybody else would get in shape. Oh, and no. by the end of the season, I'm <laughs> number two or number three on the team for regionals. And back then I lived in Italy, so Europeans, but yeah. it also taught me that if you work really hard and my dad had the saying, lay it all in the track and you'll never feel bad as long as you, you like know, did your best and my kids actually repeat back to me i laid it all on the track mom after oh. econ midterm <laughs> and things like that but i actually think never really being the best in running was the best thing for me because i realized mm -hmm. how hard it was to get to the top yeah and i think that work ethic because i wasn't the most naturally gifted at running i mean i can run forever i can run 50 miles but i'm just not fast enough probably to win most of those races but i was a contributor i was a captain so you learn all those life lessons yeah. uh, but i do think it laid the groundwork for it. you're gonna have to prep like crazy you're gonna have to work like crazy in order to be successful that's amazing. Yeah, it's so true. I had a similar, somewhat similar experience in running where I was like either the worst person on varsity or the best person on <laughs> JV. And it was a very interesting, like I was pretty good in the other sports I played. So it was a very humbling experience for me to be like, if I'm really going to try, it's like, I'm probably going to be one of the last people to finish in the varsity race. But yeah. if I try a little less, I'm going to be the first. So yeah. I love the idea. And we've talked to a few other people too of the idea that a lot of people play team sports because of the team aspect. And that we've heard so much about how great that is. And mm -hmm. obviously we feel strongly both coming from a bunch of team sports that we played, but there is so much to an individual sport like running or like tennis or, golf. or you know, any of the individual golf. Mm -hmm. Yeah. is a very good example that teach you some of the things about yourself that you might not always experience in a team sport. And I think you hit on that with running of just like it's kind of just you and whatever you want to make of it at the end of the day. And there's something very, you know, rewarding about that as well. I think the thing that I take with me and my brother and I talk about this a lot is that the difference between good and great is pushing beyond when it really hurts. Yeah. And for a long time, I struggled with the fact that I never could push past the hurt, right? I would get in great shape, but I was never the one that could deal with anaerobic exhaustion for a while or anything like that. And I think in my head, you know, I was a failure because I could never do that. But in working things, I can outwork anybody, but I couldn't do that athletically. And I always felt unfulfilled and also like I didn't live up to my dad's standards and it was it was funny because I did I wasn't good enough to run in college and that's when I turned to sports writing but finally in 1999 I decided to train for a marathon I had a little bit of time and I set a goal to break four hours mm -hmm. and my neighbors who were big runners and they were training with me and this stuff. They're like, you know, you're not going to break four hours. It's your first marathon. <laughs> and, you know, just, eh. and in the back Shoot of my head, straight. I yeah. was like, no, I'm going to try though. Yeah. Right. And yeah. to me, this was, this was the race that I was going to fulfill my potential. And I was going to make my dad proud. And my brother ran with me, which was awesome. Yeah. And we ran New York and oh. we did it, man. We did it. We broke four hours oh, awesome. and it was, and then I was like, I'm good. I'm good for the rest of my there life. I'm running. And actually <laughs> I had triplets and I don't think I ever ran another race again. Cause it's time <laughs> to try other things and, and, and golf's a whole different part of it. But it, it's funny how I just think 
racing cross country track and field it's yeah. just so humbling and like you said it's so mm. individualized but you learn so much about yourself that are life lessons definitely you learn yeah, a lot about definitely. your own your limits you learn a lot about just pain and then pushing past that pain and then realizing yeah. that failure is actually just a part of success just a part of the growth mm -hmm. like if you fail mm -hmm. it like i remember with like strength training like if you fail a rep that doesn't mean you failed period it just means your body's going to now get mm -hmm. stronger and you've pushed past that mm -hmm. point so that's a great thing i'm curious mm -hmm. Like we can, I want to dive more into your triplets and their sports journeys. I'm curious when you ran sub four, I, I believe you get like a t-shirt or a medal just automatically that just says I ran sub four and then you just have it all times. <laughs> Maybe they do now, but <laughs> I should have made myself one. Well, I just ate a lot of pizza because I was so excited and drank a lot of beer. That's an equal yeah. award, I think for sure. Equal prize, uh, in, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> of running sub four. But let's talk about, let's talk about the triplets for sure. And there's a myriad of different directions of speaking to, you know, managing, you know, career and parenthood and then their own youth sport journey. But I think we can, I'd like to focus on their own youth sport journey. I'm wondering if you can help us kind of frame up the experience as a parent of, you know, introducing them to sport and the sort of things you've seen along the way. Cause I imagine, I imagine they're grown now, like I, yeah. uh, past high school. Is that correct? Uh I'll give you the background. So 20 year old triplets. So wow. now they are sophomores in college, oh which gosh. is frightening to say, because I mean, 2003, when they were born is just yesterday. So I had a blonde or brunette and a redhead, oh, Johnny, also, Jonathan, Alexandra and Maddie, we call him jam, Johnny, Alex, Maddie. And <laughs> You know, my husband at the time was a golf magazine editor, and he's a huge golfer, played in college, Hall of Fame at Claremont McKenna, very much into golf. And at that time, well, we both were very much into golf. And I really thought, I am going to breed athletes. They're going to be <laughs> awesome. They're going to love sports just like their mom, just like their dad. And instead, you know what God gives you? People that are completely different yeah. than you. <laughs> And mm -hmm. oh, I mean, and the thing about triplets, you guys, is I, I almost wish I would have had a fourth, my husband doesn't, or a fifth <laughs> child because you learn all this stuff and there's nowhere to apply it. So my yeah. poor friends that have younger kids, I'm like, well, let me tell you something. <laughs> but I felt like I day. never... Yeah, exactly. Because I feel like I learned so much. And that's why I was so I was so excited about this podcast, because you learn yeah. so much. And I, have, I have nowhere to go with any of it. The other thing is everybody's journey is different. I always tell my kids, you can never walk in anyone's shoes. And that's why you cannot be judgmental yeah. about any choices people make because their lives are so much different than yours. But my kids, like their hair color being different, were very different. And I would say the first mistake I made was that <laughs> we decided they're all going to be golfers. So at age like two and a half, you know, they offer all these programs to take your kids out to the golf course and they're going to learn shark game. And they had no desire. To do <laughs> and so, you know, I thought... We'd have three collegiate golfers and blah. And in the end, they, they took to it in their own time, but it was in their teens. And I can tell you about my son and what happened. But yeah. I think the first lesson I learned about all of this is forcing it too early. It's just, it, you know, it's so silly when I look back on it. Let's take them to the twos soccer, indoor soccer right. training. <laughs> and I remember one year, it's hard because there's three of them, but one of them, Alexandra, she wasn't, she won't mind me saying this, but she wasn't the most coordinated of the triplets. So I wanted to give her extra attention, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, during soccer in Connecticut in the winter, I'm going to sign you up for, you know, this special camp. And lo and behold, we get there, you guys, they've got freaking Everton uniforms for these oh, eight-year-olds to practice no. their indoor soccer skills. I'm like, this is so over the top. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah. that whole big program to get my daughter up to speed so she can play yeah. soccer and we ended up not going back after two times i'm like this is insane so mm. i think overall i just think and when we moved to i'm kind of all over the map but no you're good you're good i asked for the broad experience too so you're fine <laughs> so i'll break out each one in their journey because it's all different but jonathan johnny's our athlete and we moved to florida when they were eight and he was he was kind of into soccer and baseball but you come to florida and because you can play year-round as yeah. you guys know that 
all of a sudden you want to be on this special team. You're going to have a tech coach. You're mm-hmm. going to have this and this and this. Mm. And it quickly ratcheted up because he was pretty good, but he was small. And they constantly get you in this web of more training, more this, more yeah. that. And they keep talking college scholarship. And as you guys, I'm sure you've talked about it ad nauseum on this podcast, but like it's like 4% of kids play college sports. And I, I, yeah. I just yeah. think the professionalization of youth sports is, is just kind of ruined everything. It's changed parental expectation of what it is, which is just play. Yeah. It's just yeah. play. And I fell prey to that. And that's why I say, you know, I wish I could tell everybody because Johnny... He kept progressing here in Florida. And then they were like, oh my gosh, you're on a Southeast travel team. And he was like the last kid to make the cut. And we we're all so excited because he makes this team. <laughs> but then he yeah. rides the bus to Tennessee in Alabama all weekend oh and doesn't play. He doesn't even get his, you know, his uni dirty. And <laughs> mm-hmm. he burned out in eighth grade. And he came to us one day and said, I want to go to boarding school. And I go, what? 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 Wait, where, I'm, where the I'm supposed to tell you that. I tell you to go to boarding school, not the other way yeah. around. <laughs> no. You ruined this moment for me completely. <laughs> right. I was like, what are you, we're, we're family, man. Am I a failure? Yeah. What are you? And I started yeah. crying. And oh, I'm like, by the way, we're a public school family. You're not going to boarding yeah. school. <laughs> and so he, go, he gets out of the car, goes to school, and he comes home and he goes, and I want to go to Woodbury Forest. And I was like, what's Woodbury Forest? <laughs> And it turns out he went to sleepaway camp and just the coolest counselors he met yeah. went to Woodbury Forest and it's in Southern mm-hmm. Virginia. And what we unpacked by trying to find out why he wanted to go to boarding school is he was burned out on soccer. He, you know, all of his friends were doing well and he didn't know where to go because soccer defined him and he was no longer a success, mm. at least in his mm-hmm. mind. And you know what we decided to do? We went to Woodbury Forest and said, you know what? This kid needs to get away from all the strong women in his life and go to an all boys boarding school. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't been, hear that we, problem often. <laughs> we've been saving for college, but you know what? Woodbury Forest kind of uh, saved his life is not right, but Woodbury Forest mm. is the great, a great place for a boy to grow up. Yeah. And he refound his passion for soccer because it was just playing for a team. It wasn't, yeah. you know, mm. trying to be this or trying to be that. He wasn't going to play in college or maybe he'd play you know, intramurals or club soccer, but it really, I think, gave him a passion for sports again. And he played other sports along the way. And now actually at college, he's on the Claremont McKenna ultimate Frisbee team nice. <laughs> traveling oh, around cool. California. Oh, that's, so, that's probably fun. <laughs> so I guess that's my warning to so many parents where yeah. you want to lift your kid, you want to support your kid, but it moves so fast and it maybe it's just not exactly right. And I think too, and you guys talk about this all the time is that specialization yeah. is an over specialization early in their career. Like I just wish I would have said, Hey, no, let's go try lacrosse. Yeah. Hey, you know mm-hmm. what? Instead let's go over here and do diving. You know, your school is a great swim team. You are going to go swim. Like yep. I wish I would have been firmer when the kids said no to new sports experiences that they, mm-hmm. that they would have tried more. And I think when they got intimidated and things like that, I let them off the hook too easily. Yeah, I was, well, I had a, first of all, yeah, I feel like it's, it should be said that like for your son to come to you and kind of say all that is like, I feel like that lot. says a lot about him, him. of like just like, recognizing yeah. what he needed, not being afraid to come to you. And obviously you guys have a family culture where you're very open to those <laughs> things. So that's, that alone is so yeah. awesome. Cause I feel like that's, you know, not always the case where that is sometimes where kids feel like, well, my parent just really wants me to be successful at that. And I'm just going to do that because I want to make them happy or I want to, you know, be successful and that will make them happy. And so I feel like that says a lot about your son and your family. And I just wanted to say that first and foremost, (laughs) but what would you, and then I guess the second part. So uh, obviously it is hard as a parent. And we've said this with a few guests where like, and I'm not a parent, so I'm speaking out of my you turn for sure, but I speak for me. It's I assume <laughs> I've been a youth soccer coach at a really high level. I've had some of the craziest conversations with parents about their 10 year old daughter that I ever thought I would. 
I do believe that all, most parents, you know, the vast majority are doing it because they truly do love their kid and they want the best for them. And it's hard. Like you're just flying by the seat of your pants, trying to make the decision in the moment that's best for them. And you probably also do want to expose them to sport if that's something that you find value. There's so much value in sport. So how do you balance like still pushing them to be involved in sport because we know there is so much value there mm -hmm. without really pushing them to like be intensely into it if that's not what they want. Maybe it is what they want. It's It seems such like a gray area and you probably don't have a def definite answer, but maybe just a question from your experience. Yeah. I One of the things I tell my folks at work, younger people that I talk to is you got to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Like you've got to ask for that next assignment, maybe yeah. before you're mm -hmm. ready. And I think that has to be, that also applies to youth sports. And I know it applied to my two daughters who were not as intense as Johnny, but I remember Madeline, she's just a tiny little sprite. So finally in soccer, she just, she got out muscled. She was just you know, she was like 4'10", 4'11", in eighth grade. And she started playing golf with us every Sunday morning. We had an 8'10", tee time. Mm. And she was getting mm. better and better and better. And But she, freshman year, she wouldn't go out for the golf team. And sophomore summer, we said, we're going to work all summer and you are going to try out. She was like, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not good mm -hmm. enough. But we were like, nope. We finally stood our ground to your point and mm -hmm. said, you're going to go try out. doesn't matter if you fail. It's that you just got to go try out and do that. Yeah. And mm -hmm. Leave it in on the, the end, it was, yeah, you got to, you got to put your, you got to put yourself <laughs> out there. And, but she wouldn't have done it had we not said, nope. You're gonna try out. So there are times as a parent when you need to do that. And it turned out great. She played the next three years. She was captain, never made it to mm. regionals, but that's okay. You yeah. know, she was really proud of herself. And to say you're a varsity athlete, I think it meant a lot to her, but she wouldn't have done it if she had left to herself because she knows she can go kill it in academics. But you know what? Again, you've got to have exposure to failure at some point and golf is the ultimate in failure. My God. Yeah. We could yes. talk about that for the rest of the episode of, of our own personal yeah. loves for golf. And I think it was Michael Jordan who said, it's like playing yourself in a mirror and that's why he loves it so much. But I, I I'm, I wanted to go back to like a, like a whole, so much that just popped in my head when you were talking about just like their entire journey. And I want to repeat what Marie said there. Like it's commendable for, you know, your son to be able to come up and have the wherewithal to be like, I can approach my parents about this. They will understand <laughs> and be able to make that decision for himself. It's just, it speaks to you as a parent and having that culture it speaks to him and his intelligence. And that's huge. The professionalization of sport is something I wanted to come back to where we see this a lot where organizations strive to be like, we have a very strict regiment. We are going to be doing this. You're going to be getting this kind of coaching and this kind of coaching. And then they like outline it all out. And when you break it all down, it's the equivalent of like a job. It's like a full on like professional job you've signed these kids up for. And that's not, yeah. that's not what the goal is. The goal is play. The goal is play and the goal is to learn. The goal isn't to become, prof there's no professional youth leagues so that's, that's, there's, <laughs> what are we training that for? And to the point about specialization too, the, there's so like the people that we've talked to from professional athletes to, you know, to runners of these different organizations, to people who run camps and clinics and businesses, it's the people that played a variety of different sports growing up. That's been the common denominator factor. No one that we've talked to who's been a professional in football or wherever has been like, even Rory for that matter. Like he didn't, right. like he didn't do golf only. He played all kinds of sports. He played rugby, he played soccer, he played golf. Of course that was part of it, but that was, that was important. I think it's, I guess I, I am bummed a little because I do have a tiny, my first golf bag for my daughter. And I, mm -hmm. I now realize that's probably not the best thing to do. So I'm just going to drop hints. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to drop hints and hopefully it comes to it. But subtle. Do you find. Just go to that. Just go to the range and have yeah. fun. Oh, it's for your so, yeah, there that's, you all, go. that's all. Just don't sign her up for all those lessons that I wasted money on all those years. <laughs> Because you know what? I'll say this about Johnny and Maddie and Alex. They, two of them have taken to golf. Johnny refused, I think, to play golf because we did. Because mm. at the time, yeah. both Jeff and I worked for Golf Channel. It was on in the, all the time. Mom and dad traveled for golf. So golf was not what he was interested in. Right. Then 
he goes to Woodbury. They have a nine hole golf course and he starts playing with his buddies. And then he comes back and he works at the golf club in the summer to, to make his beer money to go to college. And all of a sudden <laughs> he realizes he's really good at this. And so he comes to it at a different time, but I think he loves it more because he came to it later. Yeah. So I think there's this fallacy that you've got to be good at all these sports once you're 12 or else you'll never do yeah. it. I, I came to golf at age 24 and it's mm -hmm. a lifelong passion, but life is in chapters and you never yeah. know where these roads are going to lead you. So, but I will say to your specialization, I just wish one of those, if I could do it over again, I would have had Maddie try lacrosse. Hey, let's go learn to skate and play ice hockey. I wish we would have tried more things and forced tennis lessons on them when they didn't want to do it. And like, I remember mm -hmm. my mom saying, I'm signing you up for tennis. I was like, nope. Well, <laughs> you know what? You got to hold the line. And I wish she would have forced me to learn to play tennis. It is true. I mean, there's so many things that if you don't at least try them, you may never know whether they have a just a passion or a love for the game, mm -hmm. maybe not even playing it, but just experiencing it. And that yeah. could lead them down a path or maybe they do unlock, you know, a skill there. And I think it happens. And I know, Simon, your story, you played tennis pretty intensely and then got injured and then kind of spent more time playing another sport. And yep. you may not have ever done the other sport had you not been injured. And a lot of times that is yep. what happens is you get injured specializing in one sport and then you switch over to another and then you're like, oh my gosh, this is actually what I love and actually what I'm more talented in and, you know, X, Y, Z things. And yeah, when you're, you know, raising a kid, at least expose them and give them the opportunity yep. to self-discover what they might want versus us having our own preconceived decisions on what we want them to participate in. 100%. I think, I think there's something to be said about being... Easier said than done, I yes. feel like, but... Yes, but it's also, it's being open to striking the, I don't know if it's the balance, but just it, it, forcing someone down a track or like, and just being open and listening to what your kids want to do. And like, I think we talked to even the sports psychologist too, that we talked to Marie, that said like, my parents always gave me an out at the end of the season. Like I love softball. Mm -hmm. I play softball forever, but I, you know, I always had the out in case I just, I, I it was too much for me. Yeah, I do. I have a somewhat related question, maybe a little bit not related to directly parenting, but obviously with your role with the Olympics and with the Golf Channel, you are producing what people are watching when it comes to the Olympics. And they're, the Olympics are a good moment in time every time they come every two years for people to be exposed to yep. so many sports. You know, in at least in America, we get, you know, Football's big, baseball's big, but you know, your traditional sports, but there are so many other sports out there that are, you know, come to life when the Olympics come. Curling was like a huge hit for your, you know, for the, at least us in the Midwest, it was like yeah, yeah, now yeah. curling's mm -hmm. this huge thing. And so uh, does it ever like, maybe not in the day to day of when you're kind of doing this, but at a higher level, does it feel really like awesome or impactful for you that you're in this position to bring these stories and sports to pretty much everybody's households to experience? Is that something you've thought about? I, as we were thinking through this, I, Simon and I both came to that, like, that would be a really cool question to present to you if that's something you've thought of. Like if in the back of the head, like I may be like influencing the next you know, <laughs> great curling you athlete. I'm just you never know. <laughs> no, but there's so many stories where, you know, future champions watch the Olympics are inspired. I'll yeah. give you the story of Jordan Stoles, and you will remember that name come the 2026 Olympics. Oh he was at home in Wisconsin watching TV when Apollo Antonono won a couple of medals in mm. the 2006 Olympics. And he was like four years old. And he was like, let's try this. So his dad went in the backyard and created an actual ice rink, a, a, yeah. a, a, an oval. And he started, and he started skating and he's a prodigy's phenomenon he actually made the last olympics in beijing but that was like tangible proof that if you see it you can be it and it sparked mm. something even my daughter madeline 
watched the 2012 Olympics and saw fencing. So what did we do? We signed her up for yeah. fencing lessons. Yeah. And it was, I actually was going through the, I was trying to clear out the garage the other day. I found all these, you know, these <laughs> weapons. Things. I didn't know what to do. What do I do with the epee? What do I do with the saber? I can't just like throw them away. I guess if we get like, broken in, I'll put household. them under my bed. Yeah, I can put them under my bed and protect us. Uh, but you do, I think you do because there's some, when you talk to all these athletes, which we do, they'll always refer back to the previous yeah. generation, what Katie Ledecky did, how Simone inspired them, what Michael Phelps did. So it, it you know that it do, it is impactful because we all have role models, right? And athletes have mm-hmm. role models too. So I think there's a direct correlation between what you see and what you can be. 100%. Yeah. And I think obviously, you know, sports engine, that's h- how we kind of tie into the Olympics and just bring in that story. But it is always cool. Like, to hear a story like that and be like, I had goosebumps listening to it. It's crazy. But yeah, it's like Simone Biles didn't just come out of nowhere. Like she grew up, she played sports. She had, you know, her own experiences. She probably was inspired by the Olympians before her. And yeah, it's all, it's all very cool. So that's great. One of my one of my favorite images actually from the 2021 Olympics because it was obviously right. COVID and no yep. friends and mm. families were in the stand. So we sent cameras to families in their living rooms, mm-hmm. you know, to people that didn't travel. And Simone's gym, which she started and created, built, they had a sleepover because things oh were God. happening overnight from <laughs> Asia. And they had a sleepover mm-hmm. in this gym. And so there were like 75 girls in their sleeping bags <laughs> on this watching this big screen and waking up at three o'clock in the morning morning to watch Simone and her teammates compete. And that was just the epitome of what you're saying. You know, they want to be just like Mm -hmm. her. And so they'll wake up in the middle of night to watch her. So it was, that's one of the images I'll always remember from the Olympics. (laughs) It's really cool. Just knowing the, that the impact of like being able, you said the best, if I can see it, then I can, I can be it. And the impact of broadcasting those moments to a wide reach and how much of an effect that can have, not even from like, I'll become a professional athlete someday of just like, of just your own inspiration of like, I can, if this guy can do this gold medal run, I can, you know, get off the couch and run a 5k. I feel like that's possible. (laughs) I I wanted to ask you a little bit about, you know, when you were talking about I had the image of you like cleaning out the garage and had like six swords that you're like carrying around. <laughs> but as a, as a parent being open to like, we're going to try these new experiences and we're going we're to try fencing. But I wanted to ask you about the role that parents play in new sports and how, you know, how you, what you felt your role was, you know, during that, through those new sport activities and what role do you think parents should keep top of mind when they're either facilitating you being part of the organization as a volunteer, as an administrator, or even just as somebody on the sidelines, you know, the, that role of being a parent in youth sports. I think the thing that most impressed me when I became a sport parent was the need for volunteers and how much people do like coaches. And I, and I do have this thought that because of the demands of my job and the travel and things that I've never been able to volunteer to the capacity that I should. And like, that's my next chapter. When I finish all of this, probably Mm -hmm. after LA 28, like I can't wait to go help in schools in some way in sports to help people. Cause I didn't, I wasn't able to do it, but I was always so impressed with the parents that gave their all every single week and lined the fields and were there to, hours early (laughs) and ran the registration table. I mean, for nothing except because they wanted to give. So I am guilty of not giving you guys, but I'm going to give back (laughs) at some point and they're going to need me at some point. But I, I, my husband and I, it was so funny on the sidelines. We're completely different people. And we can talk about him because he's a high school golf coach now. But he would mm-hmm. go off in a corner and just stand and not say anything. And I was the really <laughs> loud one that was that was supportive on the sideline. But I will say, I always felt like when you got in the car, you left it all there unless yeah. they wanted to talk about it. Mm. So we didn't we didn't deconstruct or anything like that. We just moved on and got Slurpees afterwards. And I thought that was always <laughs> really important. It should be up to them. My dad used to, when I had a bad race, we would run home from the track <laughs> and all my teammates would be on the bus going home and they thought I was being punished and I wasn't being punished. I wanted to go run and work it out with yeah. my dad. Like that's the relationship 
relationship we had. But a lot of kids aren't like that. But I would say I don't have a lot of strongly grounded feelings about parenting except yeah. being supportive. And I view families as a team. And I think because mm. sports That's is so much a part it. of my life. And so Team Russell, you know, we all work together on all of this. And it, it's been a really great life. But we're completely different <laughs> people when it comes to this. But it's funny because my husband has moved on to this part of his life where he's retired and somebody asked him to be a high school golf coach. And Boy. it's been really interesting to see <laughs> him now become part of the cog in the machine. And also, you know, dealing with parents and everybody treats their child differently. And yeah. so to yeah. hear the stories of the go-getter parent and the, you know, low key parent, how all of their, I guess, how they all finish is going to be similar yet different, but there's so many different ways to get to the finish line. And I think some of it depends on your kid and their, you know, their personality, mm -hmm. their mentality, but he is seeing a lot of intense parents and not sure that that's how it how it should go but uh, you know they're kids right yeah. they get to make yeah. those decisions but we were always laissez-faire parents i would say when it came <laughs> to came to sports yeah i would say co coaching yeah gives you such a perspective on how vastly different people parent <laughs> and people you know just manage all aspects of that it's pretty wild and i think too High school would be, I've never coached any older than probably 12. And I think dealing with 12 year olds and younger is very different <laughs> than dealing with yeah. high schoolers. So I imagine he's maybe a part of some tricky situations where, some, you know, high schoolers in some families are very independent and make their own decisions and in some are not. And I imagine that could bring up some interesting conversations for you guys at home working through some of that. So have you ever thought that you would want to be a coach maybe in retirement? Or are you more like the volunteer kind of be a part of whatever's needed versus being directly on the sideline? I think be a part of something that's needed. I really want to give back in the journalism area. Mm. It just feels like uh, there'll be a high school program or maybe a college program wherever mm -hmm. we end up living someday. But do you think that I can that I have some knowledge to impart to not only young women, but anyone in journalism. So, and then to be maybe part of a university and athletic department or a high school, I think it'd be kind of fun. So I want, I know I want to give back in sports, but I'm not sure in what capacity is it, is it actual, you know, competitiveness and things like that, or is it actually journalism? Mm. I think that one that's very, that's admirable. And I'm envious of the kids that will someday learn from you and get to get to have that experience because that's, that's a gift right there and for sure and a joy. And, you know, I had a, one other question to ask you that I, I have to ask as a, <laughs> a parent, and then we'll go, we'll launch into our ending finisher here, which is this or that. Mm -hmm. But I hear about, you know, you are a mother of triplets. You have this amazing career, which has a wealth of responsibilities and the privilege and joy of bringing the Olympics to the household, millions of households. Now, the big thing that comes to mind is how, do you do that? <laughs> all of those things at once. And I don't want to say balance, but I, I, I'd love to say yeah. prior priorities. Like how, what do you, if do you have a particular methodology of how to prioritize and when, because maybe it might just be me, but that seems to be an area of like, how do I prioritize my own, my own job, my own work, but also my mm -hmm. kid and my wife and my family. Well, you hit on it directly is that there's this misuse of the phrase work-life balance because it's never, it's a seesaw, right? Yeah. It's always one yeah. thing or the other. So I always viewed it through the lens of prioritize what's important in that moment and where do you need to be? And early on, I said to myself, I am not going to have mother guilt because I don't think that's fair, right? Mm -hmm. I love my career. I love my mm -hmm. family. Why can't we do both? Yeah. There's sometimes you feel kind of shitty that you're not great at doing both, but I was going to try really hard and I was going to enjoy every moment. And so when I went to work, I was all in on work. And when I came home, it was like a factory getting the triplets through the back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, Next. Next. But also, I always, I always say that <laughs> we were lucky because we were blessed that 
but we were able to have a community to help. My parents didn't live near us, near, neither did my husband, but we had a full-time nanny and some other people can't have that. And I didn't have, you know, I didn't have to get my kid to daycare by 8 a.m. And if he had a fever, you had to pick him up at one o'clock. So I think that people have a much tougher life than I did. And I had to work a lot of hours to achieve that. But I would say that's one thing. And I just always felt as though if I lived my life like I wanted to, that it would also be a good role model for my kids to mm-hmm. be flexible, right? There, I wasn't always going to be there at 8 a.m. and 2.30 when they walk through the door, but another person who loved them was going to be there. And that was good enough for me because that's life. Mm-hmm. I'm not always going to be there. My husband's not always going to yeah. be there. So I felt like if they had good people in their life, that it would make them into flexible kids who can transition well, who were open to new experiences. And same thing with moving. I moved 12 times in 18 years. And I thought that made me a a person who is more adaptive. And I thought the same thing with my kids, that if they don't have this perfectly quaffed lifestyle, that it would probably (laughs) make them more ready for the real world. And I think in a lot of ways, you know, they've got to see a lot more things because of my job and my husband's job, and it's been better for them. But there's no magic recipe for Mm -hmm. all of this. And I just, I wasn't going to be a very good stay-at-home mom, you guys. I would have been terrible. Mm -hmm. Like, I was so much better to give them an hour in the morning and then couldn't wait to see them at six o'clock. And so the hell hours, you know, between when they eat and have to go to bed, like I was fresh and ready to go. So we had fresh people come in (laughs) to deal with the triplets every single day. And I don't know, it made me really feel fulfilled. And I think a fulfilled mom makes a better mom. And I think they had a pretty good role model too. Like I think my girls get it that they can be Mm -hmm. what they want to be. And it wasn't, and it wasn't easy either, but there's a lot of a lot of work hours involved with all of that. So this worked for our family, but like I always tell them, like everybody's everybody's different. different. Don't pass judgment. Don't pass judgment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I I think, you. I mean, what I really took away from that is just like the being present a hundred percent at where you're at right, right now. And I think that can be something that's always in the back of our heads of like, I've got, you know, 70 tabs running in my brain at one time (laughs) and it's hard to like give your full attention. Right. But that, but the difference is, They'll all be there waiting for you. Be mm-hmm. present where you are right now. Give the, give your priority there, and then you know move on when appropriate. I think that's that alone itself is worth a lot, and I appreciate you sharing that, Molly. The one thing I would tell everybody, I did this. The one thing, good thing I did right in parenting <laughs> is that because I was deathly afraid that it was so hard, like having triplets. That there's so much happening, so much good, so much crazy, so much bad that I would forget, you know, individually who each my who each of my kids were through the stages of life. So my dad was a big letter writer. I mean, I have a tome of letters from my wow. dad, which I just love. Like yeah. tw- when I was a turn 21, it was a hundred things that he remembers about my youth. It's like, it's the greatest wow. gift ever. Whoa. So, I uh, know. Can we, have, every, can we yeah, have him on next? Write this down. <laughs> write letters. <laughs> I mean, it's the, it was, it's the greatest gift ever. So what yeah, I well. did every six months, sorry, my email inbox still go, keeps going off and I forgot to turn off. I wrote my kids the first 10 years of their life. Every six months, I wrote them a letter, each of wow. them, and put it in a lockbox. Because you know how much happens in six months. Like, you know, I loved your, you know, whatever stuffed bird they have and the name they had for it. And, you know, what happened, I remember I told them that I didn't believe that tooth fairies were just girls. They were any gender. So Maddie (laughs) had Travis the tooth fairy and Johnny. (laughs) But anyway, all these crazy little memories. And I, and I wrote them letters till they were 10. And then I got really busy at golf gym. I stopped doing it, which I'm so (laughs) mad at myself and they get mad at me, but they're in a safety deposit box. Wow. And so instead of video, like I never took video, which is because I think I worked in television. I didn't want cameras rolling all the time. Mm -hmm. I took a ton of pictures but I don't think anybody ever goes back and looks at those videos anyway. But I wrote them letters and I think it's probably the only good thing I did. But when I die, they get to read the, they keep asking me, when can we read the letters? When can we read the letters? Can we read the letters when we turn 21 next year? I'm like, nope, not for a while. Nope, nope, nope. nope. My goodness, I love that though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my dad, my dad is not much of a like full letter writer, but he was very much like a, leave a note like he leaves them for my mom or he le- he left them for me on my pillow because he was he worked a lot too and he yeah it just means 
I don't know why. I think it's like the same amount of effort goes into each of the things that you're doing for people. But like yeah. letters, for some reason, are very letters. When it's, they it's went to college, last thing I did put on made their bed letter, in their yeah. freshman door, put a letter under, it, and then they yeah. they tell you they cry like babies. But letters yes. are for real. It's like emails. <laughs> it's not mm -hmm. like you go put them in a folder and go revisit them. But no. letters, yeah, like it's absolutely. an extension of you. Like there's part of you that's remaining. Your handwriting. It's how you write. Mm -hmm. your, I get it. I love that. That's fantastic. And I'm very serious. This is going to be happening now. Sorry, Zoe, in the very Sorry, future, Zoe. you're going to get a lot of these letters. <laughs> but we are going to thank Molly. Seriously, can't thank you enough for being on and being a part of the show. And we know that you have a lot going on and being a part of this podcast means a lot, not only to us, but also to our dear listeners out there. So I appreciate it. We do have one more segment, though, and it's called okay. This or That. And we have eight questions. And it's either this or that. We need gut answers only. Can clear your head, clear your mind. <laughs> We're trying on rapid fire. You ready for this? Okay. I don't want to mess it up. You, you got this. You definitely won't. Yeah. I'll go first, Sam, and I can start. Okay. All right. We're starting easy. Waffles or pancakes? Waffles. Duncan or Starbucks? Duncan. Today, Dun Duncan. <laughs> I knew it. I had Starbucks today, so. Super nachos as an appetizer. Mm. Mm. No. What, what, what appetizer would you pick? Oh, what? Chicken wings. It has to be chicken okay. wings. Okay. okay. I like that. Cups in the cupboard, right side up or upside down? Mm. Down. If you're making chocolate milk for yourself or maybe for your kids when they were growing up, syrup or powder? Powder. Winter Olympics or Summer Olympics? <gasps> no, that's like choosing between the triplets. <laughs> Not doing it. All right, fair question. <laughs> Both. 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 Um, Both. Okay. Both. Both. You're welcome. Ryder Cup or the Masters? So this is a twofold question. Which would you rather watch? And then which would you personally rather win? Okay, I'm going to choose the Ryder Cup because it's on NBC. <laughs> but the Masters, we go for live from the Masters every year. It's like a mm -hmm. national holiday. Yeah. I, again, you're asking me to choose between we two. Can't make it really we wild. got there's got to be a little bit of a difficulty in there. A <laughs> little bit of yeah. You know, okay, yeah. here's the difference. I work the Ryder Cup. I'm at home for the Masters, so it's two different things. So I get to watch the Masters and work the Ryder Cup. Okay, we'll take that. We can take that. All right, here we go. The final one. This is not this or that. Just the full question. Which sport would you want to get a medal in? And which sport do you actually think you could medal in? I would love to win a medal in track and field. I could win a medal in luge. Yeah! Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't be scared? No, I'd be scared. I'd just close my eyes and just go down the track. <laughs> just hope. Just see what happens. <laughs> Maybe bobsled, because you can kind of just be on the team bobsled, and maybe that's a little less, but yeah, I bet you each just, person yeah, has so much. Get, you just run like crazy and get on the... <laughs> that's true. Everything's <laughs> hard in both. the Olympics. They are elite athletes, and I don't have a chance. Well, let's do this. Let's yeah, let's yeah. leave this for the, for the final thought, then. What are you looking forward to most with Paris? The opening ceremony. The uh, the Olympic... The opening ceremony Paris is going to be one of a kind, they're actually going to, you know, usually the athletes march into the stadium. This time they're going to be ab aboard boats and they're going to float down the Seine River. This is so cool. And they're going to land at the base of the Eiffel Tower where they're going to light the cauldron. They're all the creative, <laughs> artistic stuff you remember in the stadium. It's actually going to be happening along the banks of the Seine River. And there's going to be 600,000 people watching oh this open air stadium goodness. ceremony. It is going to be yeah. spectacular. And you're only going to see it once in yeah. Paris in 2024. Yeah, wow. I, I've heard of that. It's going to wow. be that's going to be so wow. cool. I cannot wait to watch. Going to be amazing we, for sure. We can't so. wait. Awesome. That's well, Molly, amazing. thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. We appreciate you. We appreciate you sharing your youth sport experience, your parenting experience with youth sports. Yeah, this was awesome. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Of course. The floor is yours. Dive in, man. You just got to die. I think dive in, push those kids into all kinds of different experiences. Don't make it too serious and don't think they're all getting college scholarships. It ain't happening. Have fun. Go <laughs> Love play. It. Love it. 
Love it. Love that's it. Gonna, that's, that's all we got to say. That's our new <laughs> outro to every single episode right there, Marie. That's <laughs> wise words from Molly. Thank you so much for being on, Molly. We really appreciate it. Thank you. February 7th marks the 38th annual National Girls and Women in Sports Day, which was co-founded and continues to be powered by the Women's Sports Foundation. The foundation will commemorate its 50th anniversary during the National Day of Celebration and Advocacy, which recognizes all the girls and women who play and lead and inspires them to realize their full power through the benefit of sports. To learn how you too can join the National Girls and Women in Sports Day celebrations, head over to womensportsfoundation.org. I just think it's really amazing. Like when you think about like the Olympics and how indelible all those moments are in all of our lives, mm -hmm. like how she's behind it. Like when you think of like, I know. all, the, like just think of a highlight, think of a highlight of the Olympics and then mm -hmm. realize that Molly Solomon was likely the one who helped, I know. Make, who helped like bring this to your television. Like it's just such a cool, yeah. ex like just a cool thought and a very humbling moment. To connect with someone who not only that is, you know, a mother to three and a, and a sports mother to three too. And like can, has just the best advice. Be where your feet are is just now going to be imprinted in yeah. my brain for everything now that I do is just, I mean, if she can handle all those things and handle it, you know, with the utmost professionalism and humility and, every capability did she seem like she was somebody that you like managed all the things no she was no. Just, she right like yeah to she seemed like that a, level of calm i know it was really awesome this was one that i certainly had circled on the calendar for a long time i know you did as well it gets me excited to celebrate the olympics this year i love the olympics i think it's just the best time of year outside of maybe like a world cup but i think the olympics are right up there so yeah, it'll be exciting. We are looking forward to it. So mark it on your calendars, Paris 2024. Yeah. One more shout out for Women's Sports Foundation, yeah. who this episode was in partnership with. They are doing awesome work. We're celebrating National Girls and Women's in Sports Day. No better way to do that than to have Molly Solomon on sharing her story and the impact she's made. So yeah, with that, I think it's it, it might be time to tie a pretty little bow let's tie a bow on this episode because it has been another episode of for the love of sport as always feel free to send us an email to us at ftlospod at nbcuni.com or at sportsengine.com we love hearing from you dear listener please don't shy away from telling us your tales from the pitch the court the studio wherever or pose a question to us because if we don't know the answer odds are our guests will absolutely hold that answer for the Love of Sport is brought to you by Sports Engine, the home of you sports hosts are myself, Simon McKenzie, and the magnanimous Marie Fitzgerald. Our producers are Kelsey Irwin and Joe Brzonic, and the exceptional sound engineer who makes our voices sound like gold is the great Troy Stone. And with that, we'll be right back. Au revoir. Bye. Au revoir, Au revoir. Mes amis.